Well, it's Thursday. Bond yields are making new cycle highs. The US dollar was down, but we're seeing new signs of life. The gold price is in struggle town, and the Fed continue to frustrate the pivoteers. It's another day in the trade-off. Well, hi there, my name's Chris Wesson, Head of Research here at Pepperstone, and I'm gonna be joined in two seconds by Blake Morrow from Forex Analytics. As always, we're navigating, we're dissecting the moves, they're going for us the financial markets, the big ticket items, the big picture stories which are on everyone's radars at the moment, and the setups that you need to be aware of that are making Blake and I go, hmm. Anyway, let's bring to it, let's uh, bring Blake into the picture. Blake, it's Thursday, we've seen bond yields making new highs, it's had big ramifications, it's all one trade, it's all one trade. Bond yields up, the US dollar up, Equities down, gold price down. It's all one trade. Correlations are going closer towards one. And today, I thought I'd rock out my middle-aged man's shirt. So, so it's kind of rejection <laughs> of the, going into the wrong side of 40. I'm rocking out the middle-aged shirt. So, uh, yeah, rejection of that situation. I was going to say, you know, you sh all you need to do is drive a Corvette and put some <laughs> uh, some fuzzy uh, dice uh, hanging from your windshield or windshield uh, rear view mirror and you'd be good to go. Fuzzy so. dice. That's a so proper seven, 1970s type situation. So, yeah, we haven't done those for a while. I bring. I think the kids need to bring that one back, I reckon. For, for, I think for they funny. should. I think they should. You know, the, 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 the funny thing is, Chris, is I actually have a couple of those shirts with the little stuff on the inside, yeah. too. And I would say I'm midlife at 50, so. Yeah, date, date night with Mrs. Morrow, you bring, you bring out the big guns. and <laughs> That's right, shirt untucked, good. jeans, you got it. Crocodile skin <laughs> shoes out in there. That's right, you know it. You, <laughs> you know live in large, me. mate, live in large. Anyway, look, we've got a lot to talk about. We could be talking about my shirts and, uh, and Blake's date nights, but uh, let's go into Topical Thunder and see what's making news. Right, first one, I talked about in the synopsis there, Blake, bond markets. Now, the interesting one is whether we're looking at two-year treasuries, they've broken out again. Uh, whether you're looking at 10-year rates, or we're trading out Thor 13 at the moment, we can go into the interest rate markets. Yeah, we're con continuing to watch uh, what's happening in, in the terminal rate pricing. It's a chart I'm going to show you later. It's going to be school day when it comes to charts today, because I think there's a couple which, I, which we can show you, which can help you become better fundamental traders, if that's your jam. Um, but we have seen bond yields continue to move higher. Uh, the Fed... Um, you know, typically fashion, you're seeing the hawks being hawkish and you know pushing back. And yeah, we've seen inflation in, in Canada, but topside, UK topside, and that's moved yields a little bit higher in this situation. So breakouts coming through, and that's led to, to higher US dollar, which we can talk about in the next section there as well. But for me, what's really important, Blake, is, is twofold. The terminal rate pricing, yeah, are we going to break 5% in terms of expectations of future situations there if, where the Fed could raise rates? And also what we're seeing in the real rate situation where if you have a look at five-year real rates, this is the, the nominal treasury adjusted for expected inflation over the next five years. It's been trading in a 2% to 1.5% 1, 1 range really since you know, late September. And it's looking like it wants to break out to the top side. If, if we see five-year real rates breaking above 2%, we're trading 188 at the moment. Yeah, there's no doubt out in my mind that the dollar continues to rally, finds form, um, dolly ends up 11 days in a row at the moment, and then the equity market makes a new low at the moment. So everyone's tried to call bond yields lower. They've been struggling. How are you seeing it? Well, you know, I've, I've actually been looking for some sort of low to be formed in the bond market and yields to, to peak. But obviously, we're not seeing it right now. But you know what's interesting, and, and this is going to be the, the topic of conversation in the next topic, is that uh, is, is you're seeing the bond market move, but equities, yeah, they're under a little bit of pressure. Dollar, yeah, it's, it's keeping its bid, but they haven't been breaking out or breaking down. So I, I don't know. I'm 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 a little I'm I'm starting to wonder if, if you're gonna if you're gonna see markets really start to catch up to this move here soon. Do you think people? Do, are, you do, you, th do you think you're gonna see correlations break down? Because you have if you go across asset equities you bonds. Are. Uh, you, you've seen the the cross like the, you know, the, the like take a sixty day correlation coefficient. You have seen the correlations across asset class moving up. You know it's all really been one trade as I talked about there. But do you think yeah. you could see a situation where those correlations break down? You'd be able to need to be a bit more tactical in that situation. Oh, I think they are. I think the the market's starting to get. A, I don't want to say it's getting ahead of itself, but it's getting to a point where the the rest of the market is not paying as close of attention 
to to the uh, to the move that we're seeing in the bond market. And I guess the question would be, and I'm going to throw it back to you: is should they be? I mean, well, I think- should the S- should the S and P be trading down at 3,500 right now? Well, I think we can talk about that in the stock section, but I just want to touch on that terminal rate pricing because I think it's absolutely key. We're yeah. getting into 5% now. This is the April uh, Fed funds contract. I think that's fair valued. So I think you might get a little bit higher, you might get a little bit lower, but I think you consolidate through here. And unless we actually see that trending up and establish a new range, um, then I think you know you're, you you could see correlations break down. So for me, that 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 terminal rate pricing is absolutely key for markets. We can cover on that, and I can show you uh, again a little way of, of of assessing that for yourself. So that's an interesting one there. You know, um, I wanted to go on to the next topic, which is the dollar and 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 yields. And re- and just so you all know, when we put together these you know topics that we want to cover, uh, we don't necessarily you know talk amongst each other about what we're going to talk about. But we're talking about the same type of thing here. You know, when you see this, and and by the way, I said sun sun's out, guns out for no other reason than it's going to be summertime there in Australia. And so, Chris, you've been working out, right? You got well, you can't see. It from- Let's you can't really it, see right? it. No, you can't really see it. But yeah, I've, I've tried, mate, to be honest. But uh, it doesn't seem to sort of yield the sort of results we want. <laughs> keep trying. Keep trying. Well, anyway, um, the reason why I, I, I said, you know, US dollar and yields is that we continue to see this move lower in, in the bond market. And, um, you know, we're approaching some pretty key levels in my view, especially when you're talking about the 30-year bond market. But <clears throat> the dollar is not really responding to this move. Yes, the dollar has had a bid. And and I guess the question is, what happens if the bond market gets a bit of a reversal? You know, sentiment is so, so horribly bearish right now, and it's been bearish in the bond market, um, that I'm I'm wondering if we get a recovery rally, are we going to see the dollar really pay for it as a result and see the dollar start to come down? What are your yeah. thoughts about the dollar where we yeah. currently sit based on where the bond market's at? Blake, you've, you've heard of the US dollar smile theory, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So if you look at the, the dollar smile theory... Um, both the left-hand side of the dollar smile theory and the right-hand side of the dollar smile theory are working concurrently. This is this is a magical time for the dollar. You know, you've got on the left-hand side, you've got this risk aversion, concerns about global growth, and the dollar's been the best place to be on that situation. If you um, if you look at the the actual um, correlation coefficient against. Um, the S and P is the only currency in G10 that's got a, a deeply negative, in fact, a negative correlation there. So it's been a natural hedge against uh, global growth slowdown. On the same time, if you look at things like the economic surprise indices, um, you can see that the US has held up better. So it's 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 been the exceptional story. So you've got both sides of the small theory working well, uh, and that's why the dollar's been on a one-way tear. It's up what. 15% this year today on a trade weighted basis. Those situations are not going to change. Um, and therefore, we keep, I continue to have a structurally positive bias on the US until we see global growth bottoming. I think that's absolutely key under that smile theory that global growth bottoms and starts to move up a little bit. And we're not not there yet. The other thing is, is that we're, when we when we start seeing, um, you know, we've got past that last rate hike, uh, we start sort of procrastinating when the Fed bring it back down to neutral. Again, that's a long way off. So now uh, it's still taking a positive. Yeah, we could get a tactical downside, but structurally still pretty bullish. Your your views? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I, g- give me give me ninety nine cents to sell in the euro dollar, and I'll take it all day long at this all day point. Long. But yeah, all day long. But uh, you know, are we going to get it? That's the question, right? I mean, well, dollar yen. I, let, I, me, I, let me talk about dollar yen, mate, because we're up eleven oh, days in a row. That is reflective of dollar uh, of what's happening in terminal rates and bond yields. So, it you is. know, are, are you fading this? Are you stepping in front of this juggernaut? I have. I have already Whoa, started, but you know, there I know. Is. I already have, but hey. Stops are wide and my risk is defined. And that's all you can really ask for when you do a trade like that. And it's really small, actually, you know, but people know that uh, over the last 24 hours, that is the place that I've been putting myself. There's a lot of technical reasons, too. I didn't bring them up in this particular uh, trade off, but Mm. uh, we'll talk about that, I'm sure, throughout the show. Um, well, I want to I want to talk about gold because uh, you know we, we talk about like it's, it's all really nicely feeding in. So bond yield, US dollar, gold, it kind of all yeah. feeds filters in quite nicely, doesn't it? I mean, gold. If if when we bring up a sort of a daily chart of that, you can see for most of this year, it's been this beautiful um, downtrend. You know, obviously, if you're a gold bug, it's not so beautiful. But you know, ultimately, your day may come. It may come in twenty three. We'll have to see. I think you know, for me, taking a, a US dollar negative view in, in in is that that's how I'm seeing the world in twenty twenty three. And I think the US dollar. 
as the, the headline writers would say, will shine in, in those kind of environments. But for now, we're in a we're in a bare channel. Um, yeah, those recent lows of 1620 are, are very much in our sights. That's why I put gold to 20, 1620 there. Uh, as I talked about, their real rates, inflation adju- expected. Uh, you know, Treasury's adjusted for expected inflation. You know, if we break out sort of two percent on the top side on fives, um, that should be good for the dollar and therefore that should be bad for the for the gold price. Um, that's the way I'm looking at it at the moment. How are you how are you reading gold at the moment? Are you seeing any signs that we should be looking for a sustainably bullish retrend or are you still taking a bearish view? Well from a technical standpoint, a couple of weeks back I actually bought gold at six 1685 because the 1680 level was the breakdown point that those were those previous lows in 2021. You know the the really significant lows. And when we created that false breakdown catching all the people shorting it below yeah. that level yeah. and i figured well okay you know maybe we got a false breakdown i'll play it on that dip back to 1680 and it didn't work and and it didn't work because going back to your original topic just a few minutes ago it's all one trade right now chris it and so it, it is and and so once we broke through that 1680 we have been targeting uh 1615 which is the trend low spot trend low and I think we're going to see it. I, I mean, I, I mean, we've been targeting it for the last few days, so we're on our way down there. Unless you see the dollar really shift gears, or you see the bond market shift gears, I mean, right now the path of least resistance is lower in gold. Um, and I'm, and until it gets above seventeen hundred, it's, it's really hard to play on the long side. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I came out of a statement the other day, yeah, calling the gold price a, a dirty. <laughs> yellow pebble and yeah. uh yeah i got i got abused as you'd imagine but uh you know i traded as i see it I'm, I'm i fall in love with it when it's going up and i you know i despise it when it's going down it's just the way it is i don't i don't i don't as a trader you just trade the price and yeah i'm, I'm not going to be i'm not going to i'm not going to take a structurally longer term view but i do say i do think 2023 is shaping up for a year where i think we're going to see the dollar down and i think we're going to see gold price probably respond uh favorably to that next week um, keep your eyes on the employee cost index numbers. I think they come out on Friday. Um, yeah, that that's been really, really at the backbone of this inflation story. We can talk about shelters and all those other factors that go into core CPI. Um, but I think the Fed look at ECI, the employment cost index, very, very close. There's a number of other factors we're looking at, but I think the um, that's been super strong. Um, and put that on your radar. I think that could be a big driver of bond markets. I think that could be a big driver of the dollar and therefore gold by its extension. So that's probably going to be the thing that I'm going to be looking at as the event risk for next week as well as some the Fed speakers there. Uh, you know, and I agree. I think employment all the way around is something that everybody should be focused on in the in the in in, in this last quarter. Speaking yeah. of the last quarter, let's uh let's talk about the stock market. And uh, you know, I really wanted to get what your playbook is for the end of year because look, you know, stocks obviously they started off at the high of the year. We're down, you know, depending on what index you're looking at, 25, 30% you know, what are you looking at? The S&P, you're looking at NASDAQ. Mm. Stocks are down quite aggressively at this point. And, you know, with the with the wrecking ball dollar uh, <laughs> making its move, what is your going to be your playbook? Because I'm going to tell you what my playbook is, my forecast, if you will, in the year end is I, I you know, we've talked about Let me about ask you, Blake. Playbook. Blake, what's your playbook? Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> let me <laughs> then I'm gonna throw it back to you, Chris. So, <laughs> you know, the head and shoulder pattern for the S&P targets 3,400. I, I think that we will eventually see that, but I have to imagine that seasonals are going to come into play, and I think there are going to be value players coming in towards towards you know the 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 U.S. holidays is Thanksgiving, which would be the end of November, going into uh, the Christmas holidays that you know everybody well, a lot of people celebrate. Um, that's widely celebrated throughout the world, but I think that that year that time of year is going to give us an opportunity to buy at those levels if we dip towards. The 3400, but I kind of think that I'm in the cons- I'm like the consensus trade right now that everybody's expecting a move towards 3400 and for a bounce. And when everybody starts feeling that way, myself included, are we going to get there? So, what are your forecasts going into year end, Chris? Well, I think there's, there's two variables that we're looking at. One is real rates that I talked about. If, if that breaks yeah. convincingly above two percent on the five, so I think that that will that would probably take us through 3600. Uh, the terminal rate as well, which we'll talk about in a second. I'll show you how you can view that. Um, if we get a marked view and, and we stage a new new range above five percent, then that's going to weigh on stocks as well. So I want to see, you know, I want to see the, the, what the terminal rate is. I think at five percent, that's the kind of fair value pricing. It's above the Fed's forecasts. Um, I think that's the issue, and that's what, uh, in in the absence of being able to materially push above five percent. Uh, the base case right now is that we probably trade in the 3,600, 3,800 range. 
for the next month, perhaps through earnings season. You know, with next week we get the forty seven percent of the S and P market cap coming out. The earnings season we know time and time again is better than expected. The analysts ratchet down their forecasts; they come out better. But will they actually sort of give us any belief that you know the outlook longer term is any better? But you know, so my base case is now that we chop around thirty six hundred to thirty eight hundred. I'm a seller into you know, thirty eight hundred. I'm bigger seller into thirty nine hundred. Um, but you know, for me, it's really what happens with that terminal rate. If that can hold five percent, then it really sort of plays into my sort of range trade for now. And we sort of yeah mean reverse across those sides. So yeah, I think what you do with doing there is is good. But you know, once we get past um, get past earnings again, it continues to be the terminal rate, real rates. Um, if they can just hold and consolidate, then then I suspect that 3,600, 3,800 is is the trade that I want to be looking. Longs, longs into those 3,600, um, you know, with a tight stop, and then obviously like looking to fade it into those into those highs as well. So that's my base case, Blake, um, and we can argue against that maybe next week as well. But that, that's kind of what I'm seeing based on the terminal rates as well. So anyway, let's go into the charts. So let's see what's uh, that's the setup. <laughs> Well, I'm going to have a look at the dollar to start with, um, and not actually. I'm going to. Ch- it's a school day today, Blake. I'm actually going to have a look at something that I was talking to a couple of clients about, and, and how the way I conceptualise the the dollar move. So we talked about this dollar smile. This is two aspects that I think is really interesting. So what we've got is we've got an X and Y axis, um, and what I've done is I've taken really two qualities just to show why the US dollar is doing what it's doing, right? And and so if we go across you know, the, the x-axis from, from left to right, what we're doing is we're looking at the 60-day correlation coefficient with the S&P 500. And as you can see in the top left-hand collar, that the US dollar really is the only of the G, G7 or G10 currencies with a negative correlation. And actually, if we're doing it by value, this is now nearly 0.8 of, of, of or 0.8 correlation coefficient. So really what you're seeing is is if equities are going down, this is the place to hedge. This is the yeah. place to hedge your, your exposure. Bond yields are going up, so you you, know, you can't use bonds as a hedge against equity drawdown. So the dollar clearly there is, is if you're looking at correlations, is, is the place to go. What you're also seeing is I've used one month swap rate. So effectively, you're getting paid to be in a position if you're buying floating there. So what we've done is we use that because it's a cash-like equivalent. And what you can see in the US is you're getting 3.5% for one month swaps, our overnight index swaps. And that sort of competes with the Kiwi and the Canadian dollar. So you're getting paid to play defense, effectively. You're getting that carry, what we call it there. So why is the US dollar? I've just chosen two, two variables. Why is it doing what it's doing? If the equity market's going down, it's the only thing that's got a strong correl- negative correlation. You get a hedge there, but you get paid to be in the hedge. So this chart, to me, um, really portrays why the dollar's doing what it's doing. What do you think on that, Blake? Uh, I think it's great. I think I love the breakdown, and I love the fact that it it, it just really shows everybody that there is only one place to be at this moment as stocks are going down. But you also have to think about the flip side of that. If we do get a recovery in equities, there's going to be one place that people are not going to want to be. No, that's which right. Would be the Let me tell you, if you're a hedge fund right now, what's the best, the number one strategy that, that you have? If you're looking at thematic strategies, what's the number one strategy that, that's worked better than anything else in 2022? Carry trade, baby. Volatility adjusted carry trades, absolutely yeah. 100%. The dollar is one of the best carry trades out there, plus you get the negative. So it plays into my point. That's what it's doing, what it's doing. Yeah, <laughs> play dollar yen. And why is it at 150? Where was it? It's up 30% in the year, calendar Crazy year, move. 28%. I mean, there you go. All right, Play. let's talk about the Aussie. Because I want to talk about, look, I like the Aussie. You know why I like the Aussie? Well, I'm just going to say technically I like the Aussie because there's a lot of divergence down here and it looks like we're building a base. A lot of our um, our traders in our community have been looking at this inverted head and shoulder pattern or whatnot. I, 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 don't, I don't really care what it is. All I know is the RBA meets on Halloween. Do you guys celebrate Halloween in Australia? Not really, mate, to be honest. I think we, we, we do because the Americans tell us we probably should. Um, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. well, it might it might be spooky time if you're for an Aussie bear because that that's actually when the RBA meets is on October 31st, I believe. But anyway, I am looking to be a buyer on the Aussie dollar ahead of the RBA on a break only of 63.60. So if we get a nice daily close above that, I want to be long the Aussie dollar. I think they're going to play a little catch up 
to the RBA, I think, or the RBNZ, I think that the RBNZ, you know, showed is kind of showing us the way from a central bank perspective. Mm. And, uh, and the Aussie, the, the RBA might not be as dovish as the rest of the market believes they should be. So that's my play, but that's my setup. But it is above sixty three sixty. What yeah, so, do you think? So you, you're not you're not like bullish now. You're just waiting for the price action to 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 coax you in and get a bit of momentum mm. into the into the flow, right? So, Correct. I mean, I I I, I I yeah, I hate agreeing with you, but yeah, for me, like, I, I wouldn't be touching that until the market showed me that they they want to to push up, and that would probably coincide with the S and P breaking thirty eight hundred, which isn't my base case. So, I think for the Aussie to really get a wriggle on there, you know, it, it's going to be through there. Where I do disagree with you though, um, and my producer will love that because he wants us to argue, he wants us to hate each other, um, <laughs> is the idea about um, what the RBA are going to do. I, I think the RBA has absolutely no bearing in this whatsoever. Um, they'll raise by 25 basis points at the next one. There's no doubt that there's no way they're going to raise 50 basis points. So I think, you know, the RBA, are, 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 unless they say something which is a complete surprise to, to, the, to the street, um, I think this is just a reflection of global growth and, and, and ultimately what equity markets are doing here as well. So for this to make a, a move higher through that, through that, um, line that you're looking for. You need the S&P to break 3,800. You need to have a better feel on global growth and then you get your trade. But uh, until that point, I think it chops around. So that's the one we're looking at. Anyway, I want to go back into, into terminal rates because this, again, unfortunately, I don't have a setup. I know this is a setup, but I'm going to give you something else. What we're looking at, terminal rates, I've talked about, I'm banged on about them to the cows come home here and, and just the importance that we've got here. What I've done is on, on, on trading view, and you do have to have a, on, on trading view, is I've used the April contract. I wrote an article about it yesterday. We can, I, I'm happy to chuck it into the comments field uh, so you can have a quick read about this. But the, the Fed funds really, the futures looks at an average move uh, and priced in per, per month. And, and it looks ahead. So really, if you're looking at the April Fed funds uh, future contract, you're looking at pricing and expectations for the March meeting from the Fed. Now, what we've done is, is I've just on the right hand side on that is, is I've used different contracts and you can see the logic there, which you can type into your into your finder at the top left hand column. And, and, and basically these prices are against par, so 100, and that works out the yield on these markets or effectively what the market sees as the Fed raising to by a specific juncture. Now, what we see is April, i.e. The, the, the March Fed meeting, is priced at 4.97%. Um, that is where they, they, the market is saying we expect the Fed to raise the Fed funds rate um, by April or, or March in this case uh, to 4.9%. And you can see that as the black line on the actual chart. And you can see the correlation uh, that I've mapped out against the dollar yen. It's pretty good. You know, it has been recently as well. Uh, so are we going to break above 5%? And oh, that's the terminal rate. That's the thing I'm looking at there. So really, if you look at um, the codes that you've got there and you can create a watch list on the right hand side of rates, 100 uh, minus ZQJ uh, 2023 gives you um, effectively the, what's being priced in and expected by the market by a specific date, and we can use that to find the terminal pricing. If that continues to go up, that that's going to weigh, uh, that's going to push the dollar up and weigh on equity prices. So, Blake, is that something that you look at at all? It, well, I look at it because you look at it. And I tell you what, Chris, you are taking our, um, not only myself, but uh, the rest of the trade off community to school. And I love it. Thanks for bringing us this information, Chris. It's really invaluable. I'll, I'll dump a, I'll dump a, 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 a guide into the, into the comments section for, for an article I wrote on this yesterday. But you know, whether you're looking at real rates or whether you're looking at, at what's expected by the market in the future, that's really important. This, this is how I go about doing it. And any stuff that you yeah. guys can, you can get hold of as well. You just need to know the logic. That's awesome. And, you know, who needs a Bloomberg terminal when you got Chris Westy right here? That's the benefit of being a Pepperstone <laughs> client. Oh, All right. Hey, I'm going to move along. Uh, and you you owe me five bucks. Um, I'm going to move. <laughs> I'm going to move along. <laughs> Let's talk about it's the guppy, Chris. Oh, it Jesus is the Christ. guppy. Now, you may not be giving these guys and gals some setups, but I'm going to give you a setup here. So, uh, no, I'm, I'm joking. Hey, look, the pound yen, it. it one of the things that you might not have seen if you're not paying attention to the longer term charts, looking at some weekly charts, we um, at the 168 level was the the 618 golden Fibonacci ratio of the 2015 highs to the lows that was created, whatever, however long ago it was, like maybe two years ago, um, but or two or three years ago. But anyway, what post Brexit? OK, anyway, we're at the 618 retracement. That was key resistance for a couple of, you can see a couple of spikes earlier this year. We we tried to break above it. We tried to tag 170. We reversed and we closed back at 168. This gives us a false breakout to the upside. 
And I'll tell you what, I, I think the BOJ is going to be stepping in soon. But more importantly, trust, you can't trust her. And actually, some of the people that I talk to in the UK say that she may not be around um, within a week's time. So if that's the case, will that weigh on the on the sterling? I think at least near yeah, term. I think so I'm does, looking at a yeah. false breakout here and maybe even a push back towards the low 160s. What do you think about yeah, I like this it, mate. I like it. I like it a lot. This is kind of remember going back remember back in back in day, we talked about the Russell and that had that failed breakout. It has kind of screaming situations of, of resemblance there. Obviously different fundamentals, wildly different fundamentals. But yeah, we love false breakouts. You know, market tries to do something, the bears smack it back down, get back inside that range, you filthy pound. They say and uh, I, that's kind of where we are but yeah I tried to make a new high the momentum guys you know the trend followers were looking at this going is he ready to start trending it hasn't done it's got back inside the range um, yeah I think the pounds yeah it's benefited really nicely from a from a rollback of fiscal uh, from trust it's probably why she's going to have to go and uh, yeah I get her. she's 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 her days are numbered and I think that will, will weigh on the pound but uh, yeah I think this is I, I like the short as well I think you've got you've obviously got a well-defined short uh, stop on this plus you get the extra kicker that if the Bank of Japan go, obviously the yen strengthens and you get that kicker as well. So you're not going in there hoping that the Bank of Japan intervene, but you know that if they do, you're going to be on the right side of that trade. So that's really nice to be on as well. So love your work there. Who do I? Why do I need to bring setups when uh, Blake's bringing you the quality that you need there? Anyway, let's go into the play of the day. Let's see what's going on in town. Well, Blake, last week I um, I did an OJ, orange juice. That seems to be working quite well. Uh, it's one that you can smash up a, a million different metaphors around, but uh, you know, and puns, I think that's working quite well. Week before, Aussie Kiwi, still short that trade. That's working well, co-tightening stops on that one. I'm looking at Euro Sterling. I probably should have done um, Sterling Yen for all the reasons you looked at there. I like that. It's what didn't come on my radar, but yeah, do like that one. Similar sort of logic to what you're seeing with the Aussie. I want to wait for a move back through uh, back above 87.29, and I want to take the momentum. Why? We've got the ECB next week. They'll raise 75 basis points it's in the price. Will they talk up the idea of quantitative tightening? We'll have to look at what happens there. But if they can ring fence the BTP and Bund spread while they're doing it and talk up quantitative tightening, the Euro should rally in that situation. We can take the other side of the equation, the pound, don't like it. We know that there's political issues like there is nowhere else in the world at the moment. But the UK Parliament is as dysfunctional as we've ever seen it. Trust will have to go at some stage. The question is, is when? Uh, we also know that, that inflation looks like it's peaked. I know we had a read last night uh, taking a quite negative view uh, on the pound. It's hard to be really liking the euro. This is why I want to wait for it to just move a little bit higher through that resistance level, catch that move, uh, and obviously look to close the trade if we do see a close below the rising up trend there. So I'm waiting for the buyers to come back in, push it up into the ECB next week, also taking a negative view on the pound. I still probably prefer your, your sterling yen trade, to be fair, but this is one that's on the radar. Well, I like it, Chris. And and you know what? Uh, about the OJ trade, uh, where's your gloves? Do you leave your gloves around somewhere? <laughs> just checking, just checking. All right, hey, the next trade I want to bring up, or the my play of the day, is going to be the Euro Mex. You know, this is a trend follower's dream. You've got, mm. you know, Mexican peso, which is, talk about a, a, a great carry. Um, you know, carrying the, the Mexican peso, selling the euro. Um, I know, you know, you're on the long side of the euro, looking at the euro sterling. We should just go short, we short a, sterling mex then, shouldn't we, really? <laughs> we probably should. That might not be a bad trade. Even though my broker being in the U.S. and, and and you know, it's I, being in the U.S., I have to use a U.S. broker, unfortunately. Um, I can't trade the euro mex, but I actually trade it uh, synthetically through, you know, the euro dollar and then the dollar mex. Um, but playing the Mexican peso long right into this trend, you know, as long as risk stays stable and we don't see us break down aggressively in the equity markets you just want to play this channel to the downside it's been it's been one that's paid and it continues to pay chris and the risk is very well defined so euromex that's my short du jour and uh pl play of the day just play I like that, that yeah channel. i really like it and um you know you've got that 50 day was that 50 day moving average the yellow line that we've seen there it using is. that is obviously a really nice trend filter like we're seeing in yep. euro euro dollar the 50 days working as a beautiful trend filter all the way down like you're seeing conversely on the dollar index you're seeing it yeah that's really everyone's just basically selling into the 50 day it's just defining that trend as a as a primary trend filter for those trend followers out there so that's an interesting one to watch out anyway we've covered 
an awful lot of ground as we always do. Hit the like button. I keep saying it week in, week out. You always do, and we really, really appreciate it. Leave your comments in there. I'm going to chuck that article in about uh, the Fed funds future and using that to get terminal pricing. It's really, really important for the dollar. Leave a comment about how you're seeing the world, how you're seeing that equity call, uh, and we'll see you back next week for more of the trade-off.